Hi, so I'm Leslie Kelbling and I'm here to do a robotics research retrospective and I'm going to talk about partially observable research. So uh, in 1990, I had my first real serious brush with partial observability. Um, I had just finished my thesis on reinforcement learning and a friend, uh, David Chapman, had just finished a thesis on using perception and action to write controllers for video games. And we were both working together at the same research institute and we thought, well, a cool thing to do would be to take my reinforcement learning algorithms and run them on his video game. And he had this video game that he had implemented called Amazon and the character who was the main character was called Sonia. So we were gonna do reinforcement learning on this game. Uh, one uh, digression here, uh, just for fun, is that um, I had been working on reinforcement learning and all along I realized as I went that I had reinvented a bunch of things. Uh, there was nice old work on reinforcement learning on upper confidence bounds uh, and that work I was in complete ignorance of and so I reinvented a bunch of stuff. Um, what about reinvention? Well, I don't know. Uh, it can be comforting uh, in the sense that you know that you're on a good track because somebody else did it and so it must be a good idea. Uh, but it's better to read the literature. So we'll come back to the literature later on. Okay, so back to Sonia. Um, so we tried. We thought, okay, we'll take Q Learning and connect it up to the video game and it was a disaster. It, nothing worked at all. Um, and so we kept making the game simpler and simpler, thinking eventually we'll be able to learn this. And we had it boiled all the way down so that the character just stayed in the middle of the screen. All it could do was rotate and all it could do, so it could rotate and shoot. Those were the only actions it had. And these ghosts would appear on the horizon and move slowly toward the agent. So really there was a very clear optimal strategy, which is that it should rotate until it was lined up with the agent, with the ghost and then shoot. Um, but it still didn't work. Okay, so this is now ridiculous. It's a t we know the optimal strategy is very simple. Nothing is working. We don't know why. And then we realize that in fact, uh, the, the time uh, loop of this video game, the way David had implemented it was that it took about 20 time steps for the arrow when the agent launched it uh, to fly over to the ghost and then uh, for the ghost to die. So there was a really long temporal credit assignment problem between the agent and the ghost. And not only that, there was no indication in the video game that the arrow was flying from the agent to the ghost. So that meant that the problem was partially observed. At the moment when you looked at the state, you couldn't tell whether an arrow was already on the way. So it seemed from the game's perspective that the agent shot arrows sometimes and the ghost died sometimes, but there was no obvious connection. So what we realized was that the state representation we had was enough to encode the optimal policy. We knew that, but it didn't render the game Markov. So it made it partially observable in a way that made the reinforcement learning not work. Okay, so we added a new bit to the game. We indicated whether there was an arrow flying in a direction toward the ghost. So we thought, okay, now this is, this is gonna work great. It still didn't work very well. Uh, ultimately, the problem was that again, that 20 step delay was very long and we cooked up a new reinforcement learning algorithm that was particularly focused on handling delayed reward. And then we were able to learn to play this silly little video game. Okay, so that got me interested in partial observability and I fast forward for a while. There were other people, uh, Lonnie Christman and uh, Andrew McCallum were working on partial observability in their thesis work in the context of reinforcement learning. And so this time we actually went back and read the literature and found uh, work by Sondek and Smallwood in particular. Turns out that there was really much earlier work by Drake. Um, which had a beautiful formulation for partially observed markup decision pro processes. And just the very first algorithms that were kind of slow and naive. Um, I had two great PhD students at the time, Michael Lippmann uh, and Tony Cassandra, and Michael developed the theory and, and Tony did a lot of important implementation. And together we uh, wrote this paper in AAAI 94 
that really mostly introduced the POMDP formulation that was existing already in the OR literature and added this algorithm called the witness algorithm. Um, and uh, but we, so we ran it on actual application domains, which were bigger than the ones in the previous papers, but there was this problem called the tiger problem that had two states and two observations. Uh, we tried it on a four by four grid and this domain you see here with four states and two observations. And those really kind of were somewhat difficult for the algorithm to solve at the time. So we had a beautiful, there was just this great formulation uh, but still something that wasn't so practical. So the next thing to think about was, well, could we make it apply to bigger problems? And uh, in 1995, neural nets were cool. That was one of the previous times they were cool too. So um, one of the things that we learned from studying the optimal solution of POMDPs was that the value function of a POMDP is piecewise linear and convex uh, as a function of the belief state. So the belief state is a distribution over possible states in the world in a discrete state problem, which is all that anybody was thinking about at the time. Um, the value function looks something like this. You could imagine the x-axis here is the degree to which, let's say in a two-state problem, the degree to which the agent believes that it's in state one. And so the value function is this, uh, you can be represented as a bunch of linear functions of the belief and then the max of those. So the idea we had was to say, okay, we understand how to represent things like this in neural networks. We can say that each one of those planes is a linear function of the belief, and the final output function is the max of those things. So that's pretty easy to articulate. And we used reinforcement learning methods to adjust these things. And we were able to scale up to bigger problems, and that was kind of cool. Uh, one thing that's interesting uh, in terms of uh, reinventing wheels, this time we didn't reinvent a wheel, we, we simultaneously co-invented a wheel. So almost exactly at the same time, almost exactly the, the same algorithm uh, was also invented by Ron Parr and Stuart Russell, although they did it slightly better because where we used a hard max and a winner-take-all type architecture, uh, they smoothed out the max, which made gradient descent work a bit better. Okay, so that got us somewhere. We could solve somewhat bigger problems that way. Um, but it didn't really extend too broadly. We still had to have these belief vectors and a kind of a complicated uh, gradient descent method. It wasn't didn't take advantage of dynamic programming in such a nice way. So there was a lot of work on point-based methods, um, which focused on uh, using sampling to find the important parts of the belief space, and then dynamic programming updates to update that piecewise linear and convex representation. Um, we used those methods, uh, Kaijin Chao uh, and Tomas Lozano Perez and I used them now to finally do an application that looked at least a little bit like a real robot. So this was uh, uh, trying to picking up objects based on tactile information. Um, and a group at the National University of Singapore, uh, Hana Kurniwadi and David Chu and Wee Sun Lee, developed a really nice point-based uh, solver called SARSOP, and they applied it to a variety of robotics problems. And so now we're finally beginning to address problems that uh, are of some concern and interest to the robotics community. Still, these methods were focused on learning policies. Right. So they were all focused on the idea that we're going to find a policy offline. We'll work computationally really very hard offline to find a policy, which is a mapping from beliefs to actions. Um, and the, the advantage of that, of course, is that once you're in the world and you're behaving, uh, then it's very quick to compute the next action. It's usually it's a, it's a dot product and a max and off you go. So that's really very good. Um, but what's bad is that in some sense, the agent, the offline computation process has to figure out what to do in pretty much every situation in the world. If you know a starting state, then you only have to think about what to do in every possible belief that you might reach from that starting belief. But still, that could be a very, very big space. And it might be that in any given execution, you don't reach very many of those. And so a lot of that computation might be wasted. Um, so uh, another idea is to do model predictive control, which is to say, 
instead of actually finding this whole policy offline, we could do some search online uh, and do just enough search or planning online to pick a first action and kind of justify that it's a good idea. So uh, with a student, Kai Jen Shao, um, we did something like this um, in a, a robotics problem. So here uh, the agent is, the planner online is choosing between acting uh, as if the object is at the most likely belief and a few other actions. So it's doing a short horizon search. And then each time it picks an action, uh, it gathers information with the tactile sensors here, and it uses that information to update its belief about the pose of the object. And eventually it's able to pick it up accurately enough to actuate it. So that was a somewhat domain dependent version of this idea. Uh, David Silver, um, it came up with a nice combination of some of these ideas with particle filtering and Monte Carlo tree search uh, to develop this algorithm called POMCP. And then the group at, at NUS in Singapore went on to develop something called Despot, which is software you can download and run. And it's uh, one of the, the kind of the best domain independent right now, POMDP method that you can get a hold of. So it does a variation on Mar uh, Monte Carlo tree search uh, with techniques for reducing the variance and also with some theoretical guarantees. And they've used it to um, actually make an automated golf cart that reasons about people and which way they're going to go and, and manages not to run any of them over and so on. So a move from trying to find whole policies offline to doing some amount of planning online pretty substantially expanded the scope of problems that could be addressed. Okay, so as we're doing this, we're becoming more and more approximate. And now we wanna think about, well, can we do even bigger and more complicated problems? So what's the next step that we could take to do bigger and more complicated problems? Well, let's see, we went from considering all possible beliefs we might be in to really doing a search that's conditioned on the current belief that we have. So that's focused on the on the, the current belief. The next approximation we can make is to say, well, maybe we don't even have to take into account all the possible unlikely or even less likely than the most likely outcomes that could happen. So we're gonna think about determinizing the model, imagining that in every belief state, when we take an action, only one thing can happen. If you do that, you make the search problem much easier. It becomes a standard kind of path search problem or standard planning problem, uh, instead of something that has uh, an expectation and a maximization, the two layer sort of search that we had before. Um, it does, again, uh, it, it limits us in various ways. It keeps us from being able to take into account terrible outcomes. And so this is a move you can make that, that makes some things more efficient, but at a cost of, of correctness and, and optimality. So the way to think about the problem then is that in some sense, you have a planner that, that reasons in belief space. Right? So we're still going to assume that there's some kind of state estimation that aggregates observations into beliefs over time. Um, but the planner is going to think about what actions it can take. And from the perspective of the planner, the plant, that is to say, the thing it's controlling, is not just the environment in the world, but also the belief update. So it thinks about if I were to take this action, if I were to look in this direction or gather this information, or if I were to take an action in the world, how would that affect my belief about the world? And then it plans to drive the belief into some desired state. And so this planner can be kind of approximate. It doesn't have to be super good. It makes a plan. We take the first step, execute it in the world, get an observation, update the, the state, and then potentially make a new plan. We don't necessarily have to make a new plan every single time, but that's the basic idea. So, um, to illustrate this idea, there's a work we did with Rob Platt uh, and Russ Tedrick in the context of um, a, a, a domain that just illustrates very nicely kind of how this could go in continuous space. So one important thing is that these techniques have allowed us to scale easily to continuous state action and observation spaces. So imagine that you have a, a point robot in the plane, best kind of robot, and it 
it has some belief about where it is. It's not super good. And the way this domain works is that when the agent is in the light part, in the kind of right half of the world, it gets really good location observations as it moves around. And when it's over on the left side where it's dark, it gets poor location observations. So uh, its objective is to be at that goal state with low variance. So it wants to really be at that goal location and believe that it's there. So if it were to drive straight in that direction, uh, it wouldn't get good localization and it wouldn't be able to go and stand on the goal with low variance because it would be uncertain about its location. So it actually has to think about moving into some part of the space for the purpose of gathering information. Uh, so how can we think about this problem? Well, one thing you can do is say, all right, I'm going to represent the belief, let's say, as a Gaussian. In this simple case, we could think, okay, there's a mean and a covariance. And my objective is to arrive at some state where the mean is, the, is near the goal that I have in the state space and with low variance, maybe not zero variance. So if you do that, then you have this interesting question of what are the dynamics, right? So if you say, okay, I have a representation of the state, that's kind of good. And uh, you could say the way I'm going to update my state when I get an observation, the dynamics of the belief are given my previous belief, so my previous mu and sigma, and an observation and an action, I could use some kind of call, common filter to compute the next mean and standard deviation. But the problem is that the observations are uncertain, right? When I take an action, I can't, I don't know for sure what observation is gonna happen. That's a probabilistic choice that's governed by the environment. And so I can't really use this equation as my dynamics for planning if I want to have a deterministic model. So what we can do is say that, uh, although I don't know exactly what observation is going to happen, I can make a kind of idealized dynamics under the assumption that uh, the average observation or the most likely observation is the one that's going to happen. And if I do that, then my belief update depends only on my previous belief and my action. Uh, and here we've indicated some normal noise. So that gives us the dynamics that we can use to do planning. So if we use that dynamics to do planning in this example, the robot plans this trajectory that's shown in a dotted line. So uh, it says, well, if I get the observations I'm expecting to get, I'll go over a hangout in the light for a while where I get good observations, get myself really localized, and then run back to the goal. But actually, in this example that I'm going to show, the robot really, even though it thinks it's up here, it's actually really down here. And so but it, it, every time it gets an observation, it updates its belief. And so what happens is that although it's trying to track this dotted trajectory, it really ends up tracking a trajectory that, that heads downward because the observations it's getting are actually telling it it's below there. So what happens is after a few steps of this, it makes a new plan. And if it keeps replanning as it's going, what happens is that it starts out moving downward because it thinks it's up here and it moves down and down, but it's also moving over into the light to gather information and it's getting better and better localized. And then it finally drives back over to the location that it was supposed to be going to. So you end up with a kind of robustness by doing closed loop replanning, even though the model that we're using is, is pretty approximate. So we took those ideas and tried to apply them now to uh, a kind of building toward a general purpose robot that could do things in a house. Uh, it's in a system we call belief space hierarchical planning in the now, which I can just sketch out just a little bit. Um, one thing is that uh, we have an open world belief state. So the idea is the robot doesn't necessarily know how many objects there are in the world in advance. And as it looks around in the world and sees things, it grows a database of objects. And for each of those objects, it represents a distribution over what type of object it is, maybe its mass, its position in the world, and so on. It also has a representation of what space it thinks is filled and what space is not, and so on. So this is a very complicated belief state. Right now, we've gone kind of pretty far from just a simple enumerated set of states. So we have a complicated belief. We also, in once the belief states get very big and very complicated, we need a more sophisticated representation for planning. And we end up developing a, a, a representation that lets us use uh, 
ideas from logic that let us abstract away from particular belief states and talk about sets of belief states, like the, the states in which I think that this object is on the table with high probability. So we have a language for talking about interesting sets of beliefs, and we can use that language as a representation for planning. Uh, the other important idea in, in BHPN is hierarchy. So as much as we want to try to make POMDP planning and solution efficient, uh, eventually, no matter how efficient your algorithm is, the horizon will get you, right? So the, in the end, search is almost always dependent, usually exponentially, on the, the planning horizon. And so figuring out a way to decrease, effectively decrease the planning horizon is important. So uh, ideas of of hierarchical decomposition really can make a long horizon problem tractable if you're able to take a very long horizon problem and only ever pose for yourself relatively short horizon subproblems. So that's another piece of this puzzle. So eventually, with all those things put together, we have this robot which can use real perception to update its belief about objects. Um, and plan to take actions. Here's a nice example where it's supposed to move the blue, the green object to the corner of the table. It knows it's pushing is pretty unreliable. So after pushing, it actually plans to look and see where the object is. It realizes the object's not where it's supposed to be. And by replanning, it takes action until it goes where it's supposed to. This is just kind of fun. Here we told the robot to go out of the lab. There are some objects in the way. It sees the objects and realizes it has to move them. And there, here, it actually took one of the chairs out the door with it because we didn't tell it not to. We just told it to go out of the door. So what lessons can we learn from this adventure? Uh, we started out with the tiger problem with two states and two observations and the optimal policy shown there in the little blue state diagram. And we ended up with this PR2 doing reasonably complicated things in domains that are much more open in state spaces that it's hard to even count the dimensionality of. So given that we ended up pretty far from where we started, was it useful to have taken this whole journey? Um, and I would argue yes. Uh, I think it's really important that you have a deep understanding of if you're going to approximate, it's still important to understand the form of an optimal solution. Sometimes that gives you really good insights into how to do the problem. The most important thing we learned from the basic POMDP solution stuff is that it's important and useful to have a, a framework that unifies acting for the purposes of getting information and the purposes of changing the state of the world. In general, every action you take will have both kinds of consequences. And so integrating them and not having to treat one type of action especially differently from the other is a way that, that, that makes systems actually easier to implement. Um, the idea that we model the evolution of the belief over time instead of trying to model the evolution of the state itself uh, lets us do information gathering in a way that's very focused and task driven. We also learned uh, that optimal policies are complicated and, and, and hard to derive, but still some ideas about their structure can inform what we're doing later. So all of this work was based on knowing a model of the world dynamics and the observation function. So how it is that the observations that the agent gets relate to the actual underlying state of the world. And so now, of course, everyone wants to work on learning. And so I think the critical thing and the way to drive this program forward is to think about ways that we can acquire observation models and transition models efficiently and from various kinds of self-supervised data. So thanks. I hope the journey has been interesting to you.